Okay, morning everyone. So this is a follow-up talk from my uh, one yesterday on um, banking security. And this time it's going to focus on online banking security. So in the previous talk, I was talking about the EMV system, which is the way of dealing with the counterfeit fraud, lost and stolen fraud, mail non-receipt where a card is stolen um, as it's being sent. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to be discussing card not present transactions and online banking. As you can see, card not present transactions are uh, very large compared to all other types of transaction, um, all other types of transaction fraud. Um, this was somewhat surprising to the banks because they thought that they were going to invest um, all of their money in um, ways of um, defeating the counterfeit lost and stolen and mail non receipt because that's what they thought were going to be the more what the techniques which were used by criminals for the most effect but they were in some ways a bit blindsided by the rise in card not present fraud and this was mainly driven not by the, the fraudsters, but by the fact that more people were shopping online. And so, although the, there's been a dr dramatic increase in card not present fraud, this has been matched by a dramatic increase in the number of people using cards. So the actual percentage compared to some other um, types of transactions is not as bad as it might first seem. But when chip and pin was being considered, well, arguably 15 years ago, somewhere around here or even further along there, card not present was small, but even by the time they'd started deploying chip and pin, it was the, the dominant type of fraud that was going on. Um, the other thing that's important to note from these figures, I'm using the UK as an example, other countries except the US will be fairly similar. The reason I'm using UK is that it's one of the few countries to publish details, fraud, detailed fraud figures. Some countries don't even collect it, and most which do collect it don't make this available to the public. But it does have some serious limitations. One is, this only shows the losses of, um, for the banks and the, cost, uh, and the shops, the merchants. It doesn't include the losses to the customer. And there's been a variety of estimates anywhere between 3 and 30% as to how much of losses are actually borne by the customer. But I'll talk more about the liability situation later. And this also doesn't break down fraud losses between uh, the merchants and the banks. In practice, a lot of the counterfeit fraud and lost and stolen fraud will be borne by banks and a lot of the card not present fraud will be borne by merchants because if a shop accepts an online payment where the card is not present, um, internet, mail order, telephone, then it's almost certainly the liability of the merchant when something goes wrong. If it turns out to be fraudulent, not only will they not get the money, they'll also have to pay the bank for processing information about the fraudulent transaction as part of a chargeback fee. But it's clear as a problem here, someone is getting hold of card details. And by card details, I mean things like the PAN, which is the number written on the front of the card, the primary account number. There isn't a secondary account number, but for historical reasons, it's called the PAN. Um, the expiry date is generally needed in order to pour, perform a card transaction. This is a, a weak password associated with the card. The CVV2 was a new security feature in, uh, that was introduced. This is the three digits on the back of the card that most, but not all, merchants will require you to enter. And there's also some checking performed on the name and the address registered to the cardholder. Again, this is optional. Some payment systems don't support sending this information back and some of the checking is not as good as you might hope. One thing that some banks have been forced to do is they can only transport numerical data, 
So all they do is they take the numerical bits of the address and then send that across. And some criminals worked this out and were able to find an alternative address which had the same numbers, corresponding numbers, as the cartel's address and then get the goods delivered here. The reason that there's quite a lot of variation in terms of which card details are requested is merchants have found that the more they ask for, the more sales they lose. If someone enters their card number, then that's probably going to be essential. But if you start asking them to enter in the um, expiry date, the CVV2, if you start checking that their name matches, um, they won't be able to deliver to a work address perhaps, then they might just give up and go to a bricks and mortar high street store instead. And although fraud is a significant cost for merchants, it could be up to 20% of sales are lost during the checkout stage, just as people get annoyed by security measures and as people start to think whether they really needed this thing that they've just impulse bought. And so some merchants have decided to skip many of these security measures. Uh, Amazon are a notable one where they do not ask for the CVV2. This means that their fraud will increase and also they'll have to accept more liability for a fraud when it happens, but they're big enough to, first of all, do some sort of fraud detection and look for suspicious pur purchases, and also they're going to be um, much more willing to um, just accept that losses of fraud and then trade that off against the sales which they would not have otherwise been able to make. These details, um, when they're used for fraudulent purposes, can come from a number of sources. Um, one is compromised merchants. When the big merchants get compromised, this makes the news, but lots of small merchants get hacked into and they manage to get card details from these. And then these can be then used for future online transactions. It's even possible to try to use randomly generated card numbers. This will only work if there's almost no checking performed by the, um, the merchant, but for many online goods, the fixed cost of developing it is high and the marginal cost is extremely low. Um, and so giving away your product to a fraudster doesn't actually cost you that much. You might be losing out on a real sale, but probably not. Um, so websites selling pornographic content um, basically perform no checks because they would rather potentially make a sale than cause someone not to buy from them. Um, there are also some merchants who are criminals. Again, pornographic websites fall into this category. There was a website in the US um, which was hosting various types of pornography, um, some legal, some illegal, and people who um, were buying legal content on this were finding that they were being billed a second time for downloading illegal child abuse images. And as a result, some of these cardholders um, who bought uh, um, legal images found themselves being prosecuted for supplying funds to people c conducting child abuse. Um, many were arrested, um, quite a high proportion actually killed themselves before trial um, because they were quite worried about the publicity that would come out about this. Um, and this website even started um, using stolen card details and processing these for um, downloading uh, or paying for child abuse images and as a result people who were just random, randomly selected were finding themselves having their door broken down by the police for no good reason and the police investigations um, were not sufficiently diligent to pick up many of these cases and many people accepted a, um, a criminal prosecution as a result. An increasing trend for collecting card details is malware. So someone gets some malicious software on your computer via drive-by download, um, sending it in an attachment, and then it just looks for card details that are stored in your computer. If your browser remembers these, 
our car details that you enter. Um, this probably isn't the main reason that the malware is installed in your computer, but once it, get, it gets there, they might as well use it for that purpose. Um, another set of frauds are done by people near the cardholder. By this I mean people living in the same house, um, friends, family, who can fairly easily get all the information they need in order to perform card transactions. And then they use these online and the customer ends up disputing these. And these are probably the most problematic to deal with because someone who is close to you probably has all the security questions and all the security details that they need in order to pass all the checks that the bank might try. And as a result, this could be um, quite hard to unpick. And the, the final set of frauds um, are to do with the, the cardholder themselves. Um, they may knowingly perform a transaction, but then later on say they didn't do this. Uh, most of the time this is an accident, they just don't recognise whatever appeared in the statement and that might get sorted out. But sometimes they deliberately try to avoid paying um, because they um, either are too embarrassed at what they've bought or they just want to keep more money for themselves. And trying to differentiate the cardholder themselves from the other categories of fraud and particularly people near the cardholder can be extremely challenging. So the card industry has gradually recognised that they've got a problem and one of the solutions for dealing with this is uh, PCI DSS. So PCI is the payment card industry body and that was set up by all the major um, card brands, so Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Amex. And it tried to unify the standards which they already had for protecting cardholder details. Um, some of these were specific to cards, so in particular it forbade the storing of the CVV2. The idea is that if someone grabs your database, they won't be able to get the CVV2, they can get the rest of the details, and it's only if someone is actually in your computer looking at the data as it's flowing that they'll be able to get the CVV2. So that improves the situation a bit. It reduced the risk from data at rest. It didn't reduce the risk from data at motion, um, but that's still an improvement. And the rest of the requirements are really quite standard things that you might see from any sort of security standard. So building a secure network, um, protecting data, um, building a vulnerability management program so that when something goes wrong, you're able to mitigate it. Um, access control, particularly to protect against insider attacks, so people inside your organization committing fraud. Doing monitoring testing to make sure whatever you're doing um, is actually doing what you expect it to. And then finally, having a policy which covers all the other topics of this. So the standard itself is moderately sensible. It's very expensive to comply with and merchants are quite unhappy about this. Um, they've seen these requirements put on them by the banks. Um, the banks do have to comply with them, but they already had most of the procedures to do so, whereas merchants had to invest a lot of cost, first of all, in deploying these changes, and secondly, going through the certification process that's necessary in order to process card data. Uh, and process card data. Um, and it has probably improved the situation. It certainly hasn't stopped all of these problems, but it has provided some incentives for people to do better. In particular, if it's found that you've broken PCI DSS rules and you're the victim of fraud, then, oh, sorry, and then someone is the victim of fraud, then the per person who violated the rules is going to likely be responsible for issuing replacement cards um, because that's typically what you have to do if um, a fraud happens. But fundamentally, PCI DSS is trying to do something impossible. It's trying to maintain the secrecy of a number you tell everyone, the number on the front of your card. So it's right there for anyone who looks. You tell it to lots of websites, 
merchants will store this because they want to track you um, and it flows over un um, unencrypted data links repeatedly as it's being used for processing card transactions. So it's ultimately an uphill battle to try to maintain the secrecy of this card number. So the recognition of this came quite a long time ago and there was a scheme called SET, Secure Electronic Transactions. Um, this was fairly clever, it seemed moderately secure, but it never really caught on. And that was for two main reasons. The first was that it required software to be installed on the end user's computer in order to do all the crypto. And that was going to be very difficult to deploy to everyone. And secondly, it also was seen to be increasing the liability for the customer. The reason that card transactions are so popular online is that most of the time, if something goes wrong, the customer isn't going to lose out, they're going to get the money. And the merchants who accept, card uh, accept credit cards pay quite a high premium for this. Maybe 3%, 5% of the transaction goes to the card companies. So the card companies are making vast amounts of money for essentially selling um, an um, insurance service. But what 3D Secure, or sorry, what SET was going to introduce was taking away that insurance, passing the cost back to the customer, but the merchants still paying for it. So the incentives weren't really set up for that to get any significant deployment. But still, it did get um, ruled out at the interchange level, so allowing merchants and banks to communicate with each other. Uh, so when there was a recognition that SET had failed, the rails which had already been set up for using SET were replaced um, or, or were reused for the 3D secure system. So if you've done online card transactions, you might have seen this. You go through your standard shopping process and then at the end you say that you want to pay and then um, either you get a pop-up or more normally you get um, an iframe um, appearing in the, the shop's browser window. And this iframe is the result of a redirect. So firstly, the merchant has sent your card details off to Visa or MasterCard or JCB. Um, you can work out what that is just by looking at the front of the card number. And then Visa or MasterCard have first of all checked whether the customer has enrolled or whether the bank has enrolled in 3D Secure. And if so, it will give an address, a web address, to the merchant to redirect the customer to. And this address is controlled by the bank which issued the card, but in almost all cases, this will not be run by the bank themselves. This will be run by an outsourced service provider. The common ones that you'll see are Arcot and Ciotta, um, and you also see the domain name securesuite.co.uk um, if you see this in, in the UK. There's probably other domain names for these two companies in other countries. Um, and what this website that the customer has been redirected to uh, does is up to the bank, really. It can do nothing and just redirect back to the merchant. Um, it can ask for a password, it can ask for a one-time password, um, it can ask for the customer to enter a password if they haven't already set one up for um, performing 3D Secure. Um, it can also give the customer to op the opportunity to opt out, although banks tend not to like doing that. But once these steps have been performed, the bank performs the checks and then sends the customer back to the merchant's website. The merchant's website records the result of this and then they can make some sort of decision. Typically, if the authentication fails, they'll reject the transaction. Um, if it succeeds, they'll accept the transaction. And if the customer has um, tried to opt out of enrolling with 3D Secure, they'll probably still accept the transaction and then deal with the potential losses that come from that. Um, but sometimes, if the merchant is particularly risk averse, 
they might decide to just reject the transaction outright at that stage. So the advantage of this compared to SET is that there was no special hardware or software needed. So no smart cards are involved unless the bank wants to do that. Um, and also there's nothing that you need to have on your computer other than a web browser. But it's not as good as you might hope. And one of the reasons is because of usability problems. The serious usability problem that comes up is the customer is now being asked to enter a bank password on someone else's website. Now, we might know that this is an iframe sitting in someone else's website, but almost all bank customers are not going to be able to recognize that. What they now see is they are asked to enter a password on other people's websites. So Crimno's worked out this. Um, in some ways, they've got a better understanding of humans than most of the banks, and they come up with um, these websites. Um, this one was sent in an email, and this is asking for your um, social security number, obviously US, um, card number, expiry date, um, signature code, um, then they ask for the card pin code, and then they ask a customer to choose a password, and then say to activate, verify by Visa. But of course, these card details will instead be used by, uh, for fraud. Um, what they're probably interested in doing is um, um, ATM fraud, because they've asked for the PIN. Um, but they also might be interested in doing online fraud. That's why they've got the signature code. And they might also be doing some um, fraud through false representation, so impersonating the customer in order to get a loan, and that's why they've got the social security number. Um, in fact, these types of frauds don't work as well as you might think because customers start to realize that this is too much information being asked. Um, in fact, more recently, criminals have worked this out and are asking for a bit less data. Uh, here's another one. So the not a particularly well-designed phishing website again, um, but what this um, is trying to do is asking for um, what type of card you're using, card number, expiry date, CV2, ATM, um, name on card. You might think it's entirely implausible that the bank would ever ask for your PIN online, um, but in fact, some banks do use the PIN as the information they ask for securing online banking, which is a particularly bad idea but still, some of them do it. So the big problem that I've illustrated is how do you know that this is going to be your bank when you are asked to type in a password? So it's an iframe, so there's not going to be any address bar visible. Um, if you right click on it and then you can find some details, you might be able to work something out. Um, but then you'll see names like Arcort or Ciotta or Secure Suite. This isn't your bank either. So is this really something that you should be typing passwords into as well? Um, and progressively, the usability has supposedly been improved, but in order to um, reduce costs, it's actually quite reduced security. The first deployments of 3D Secure, the customer was sent their password in the mail. This is about all the bank can do to work out who the right customer is. They know your address, so they send you something. But this is expensive. You have to send out a letter to everyone who wants to use this, and that also introduces some delay. So the banks introduce activation during shopping. Uh, that's where you're not asked for the password that you set before, but you're asked to choose a password. And because you're asked to choose a password, you have to give the full password um, rather than when you're being challenged for providing the previous password you gave, where you might only have to give a few letters. And now the customer is a bit confused because they're being asked for a full bank password rather than being asked for, say, the first, second, and third characters only. Uh, the other change that happened is there used to be pop-ups displayed it's where you could at least see that this was an encrypted website you were going to. It wasn't the merchant, and hopefully it was your bank but it was found that many customers had pop-up blockers, so that's instead why they went for the iframe solution. Um, 
But if you compare this to, say, Google authentication, they have gone for a pop-up. They've managed to find a way to make most browsers happy with it. And there, you can at least see that when you're typing in your Google password, in order to log into a different website, you are um, actually typing into a, a Google encrypted form. In some ways, you can think of 3D Secure as a sign, single sign-on system. So things like Facebook login, things, um, things like Google. Um, but the big difference between it and Google is that liability gets moved around when these steps are being performed. So when this system did get rolled out, I was a bit curious about it. And actually, I, I was quite suspicious when I saw someone asking for a bank password um, on an iframe which didn't belong to the bank. So I called my bank. And they said, yes, that's phishing. You shouldn't type in your password. And it turns out even the bank weren't able to tell the difference between um, one of their own websites and a phishing website. So here's a section from the terms and conditions of um, RBS, so Royal Bank of Scotland, um, I think Citizen Bank in the, the US. And they say that you understand that you're financially responsible for all uses of RBS Secure. Um, so RBS Secure is RBS's version of um, 3D Secure. So what they're basically saying is that if someone finds out your password, um, guesses your password, breaks into a system and works out your password, or just manages to somehow bypass the password check, then it's going to be your problem and you'll have to deal with this. And most of the time, banks have not taken advantage of terms and conditions like this. But in some cases, they have. And increasingly, it seems like they're starting to do this. So that was talking about um, cardinal present transactions, so the top line here. Um, but the next topic I'm going to go into um, is um, online banking security. And this is this line here. So this is obviously nowhere near as high as the fraud figures, but it has gone up and down. And last year, it started to go up again. So it's enough to be concerning to the banks. And as I mentioned, almost always, it's the banks which pay the cost for frauds that happen through online banking. So they're very motivated in doing something about this. Um, but again, they sometimes do change the term, terms and conditions to try to make customers um, liable for transactions that happen. And in extreme cases, they've even reported to the police someone who has said that some fraudulent transactions have appeared on their account because the bank believes that not only has the transaction happened, but it really was the customer who did the transaction and is now denying it in order to try to defraud the bank. And in some cases, they might be right. But I think in this case, which I'll show you, they probably were wrong. Jane Badger is one of them. She was working for the police in 2006 when she reported a fraudulent transaction of £772 on her end credit card. She expected to get her money back. She was in for a shock. What happened was recorded on her home security camera. On Wednesday morning, I was sitting watching TV, children in beds, and I recognised these people from work. I opened the front door, and they proceeded to tell me that I'd been arrested for fraud by false representation. I was being arrested by my own work colleagues. Totally embarrassed. My neighbour actually came over and said to my husband um, a day or two later, we actually thought Jane had killed you. Officers turned up at my house. I'm led away. All these other cars pull up, but all these officers get out, put gloves on. So they obviously thought that there was something serious to do. Jane's house was searched. She was suspended from her job, charged, and taken to court. I couldn't go out. I couldn't do much at all. I just thought everybody thought I was guilty. And that's the way I, I was telling myself the other day, thinking that maybe I must be guilty. I know I'm not, but how can I prove that? I can't prove that. That I wasn't guilty. What was your darkest moment? My darkest moment, I think, was when I, I thought, I can't take anymore. I can't face anybody. Everybody's talking about me. 
So I thought the best thing to do was to get my mind. And you actually spent a long time thinking about it? I did spend a long time thinking about it, but, but it would only be my husband that would find me. It, it, the place I would do it, he could only see me. The children would definitely not be at home. So he, he would find me and only him. And he, he knows how desperate I've been because he's been there throughout it. He's been there when I've not slept, when I've sat up and talked to him and talked and talked. It took over our life. Luckily, Jane heard about Professor Anderson. With his expert help, the case against her collapsed and she was acquitted. She and husband Dave have come to Cambridge to thank him. Hi. Hello. I've got so much to thank you for, that we have. says the banking code gives enough protection, but Professor Anderson believes the law needs strengthening. I believe that what the UK needs to do is to follow the American lead. There, Regulation E, which governs electronic banking, places the burden of proof squarely on the bank. So unless the bank has a direct physical evidence that you actually did that transaction, say an ATM camera or photograph, they will give you your money back. Jane went back to her job with the police, but she still wants to clear her name. She's never had a reply from Ed to any of her letters. We asked them to explain, but they declined. What would you like to say to the chief executive of Ed? I'm not all about money. I don't want conversation. I don't, you know, even if they didn't give my money back, I'm not that interested in the money side of things. I want an apology. I want them to go out there and say, actually, we did get it wrong, Jane. We are sorry. So uh, as you can see with both this case um, and the website in the US which was using cardholders details for fraudulent purchases of child abuse images as well as the financial cost, there being quite a high human cost of fraud that comes from these. And Jane Badger never did get her money back from Egg or she never, and she never did get an adequate answer from them as to why this happened. So with them, um, Online banking fraud, there has been quite a significant increase um, in how much fraud has been going on, at least in the UK, um, but other countries are going to be relatively similar. Still, most of the fraud in the UK is relatively simple phishing emails. Many UK banks only ask for a username and password in order to log in and in order to perform a certain types of transactions and therefore once you've got this password you can impersonate the user so you start getting emails a bit like that to say that in order to continue using online banking you need to reconfirm your password um, on this website the other way that information is being collected is through keyboard loggers um, these still work to some extent um, but because of the comparatively poor security of some banks, they're the ones who get targeted for fraud. As a result, there are some efforts in trying to improve the situation. So you might have seen some of these techniques. Um, these are all relatively cheap and so are being quite easy to deploy um, compared to hardware tokens being sent out to some customers. Um, so one is on-screen keyboards. It's really not clear if these work at all because all it requires is that malware record where you click when you're typing in passwords rather than um, whether you have to um, record the keystrokes that are being entered. Uh, also, it's common to not ask for the full password, so just ask for characters 1, 7 and 9 in this particular example. Um, the hope is that customers will not give their full password to a website they only give the, a few characters, and that means that the bank is, or the criminal will not be able to perform a transaction um, in the future because they don't know what letters 
that the bank is going to ask from them. Um, again, in practice, this probably wouldn't work very well because it's going to be relatively easy to social engineer a customer to type in the full password. Um, so the, the idea behind this is to make it hard to collect enough information, but another approach is to perform some sort of mutual authentication between the bank and the customer to make sure the customer can distinguish between phishing websites and the real bank websites. Um, some American banks have done this. Um, this is the Bank of America. And what they ask you to do is choose some phrase, um, choose a picture, and then hopefully the phishing website will not be able to display the correct picture for you. Um, and therefore, you'll recognize this and then type in your password. Again, there's not any particularly good evidence that this does, does very much. Um, device fingerprinting, for those of you who are at the, the browser fingerprinting talk, um, this has the advantage of not being something that is visible to the user and therefore not something that the user is going to be annoyed about, hopefully. And this technique works by trying to see if the user who's visiting today is similar to the user who visited pre on previous occasions. If there's a dramatic difference, say the, the country code changes or the browser changes or there's some other odd behavior, then either there should be more security checks performed or transactions should be just completely rejected. Uh, it does have the disadvantage that if you move between devices, then you can end up with problems. And another option is one-time passwords. So the, you, the way that this used to be performed in Germany, really back to the stage where telephone banking was first introduced, was that a customer would be sent out a letter containing 100 randomly generated or cryptographically generated six-digit numbers. And then the customer would have to enter one of these into the banking website or give these over telephone banking in order to perform each transaction. Um, this is in some ways relatively good because if you ask for one of these TANs, then that allow you to perform one transaction, it won't allow you to perform them all. Um, but it has um, been relatively well exploited by criminals um, in order to bypass them um, by performing man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, what, well, sorry, not man-in-the-middle attacks, but by just asking customers for, say, three, a plausible number of them, and then once you've got this plausible number of TANs, you can then perform a few transactions. So the reaction to this from the German bank industry is something called ITAN, um, this is very similar to TAN, except now, rather being asked to give any TAN, or at least the next TAN, um, you're given an instruction to give a particular one. So you might have a sheet of 100 TANs, and then the website will say, please give TAN number 35. So you go to your sheet, you look up TAN 35, you get the six-digit code, and then you type this back into the web browser, and this means that in order for a criminal to be guaranteed to know what TAN they need to perform a transaction is they need to have a whole copy of that sheet. They ask the, have to ask the customer for all of them, or at least a large enough proportion that they're very likely to be able to um, guess the right TAN that the bank's going to ask for. But as you might have realized, all of these techniques have been bypassed. And how they're being bypassed is through man-in-the-middle attacks, or sometimes called um, the man-in-the-browser attack. Um, this is where some malware gets on your computer and it has full control over what you see and what the network sees, and it can make the bank think one thing, whereas it can display something to the customer that is entirely different. So if you've got malware on your computer, then obviously you can see what is being typed with the on-screen password. Um, you can see what picture password the bank is going to send to you, and then you can generate the, exactly the same one. Um, device fingerprinting is equally going to be defeated because it's your own browser which is talking to the bank, not the criminal's browser, even though the criminals are in control of your browser. 
and one-time passwords, whether these are token-based um, things that you push a button and you get a number, um, or whether there are things like ITAN, will also be relatively easy defeated, easily defeated because the bank will ask for a particular TAN, it will show that to the user, and then the user will type that in. But what they don't know is whether the transaction that the bank is going to perform is the one that the customer wants. So here's one way of looking at the man in the browser attack. The customer sees that they're looking at their usual bank website and they're transferring money to um, this account. And then they will type in a one-time password or the bank will ask them for a one-time password. This one-time password is sent unchanged to the bank, so the bank's happy, but the account number that the money is being sent and possibly the amount is going to be very different. So in order to try to defeat this, we need to somehow bind this authentication code to the transaction which is performed, such that if you change the transaction, this response code is no longer going to be valid. So a relatively cheap way of doing this is basically captures. So you try to combine various bits of information that the criminal will find hard to automatically um, decode. So the, there is a usability problem here that it's a bit hard to work out what's going on. Um, but this website is an um, online banking website. Um, the, it's been a request to transfer some money to someone else's account. And then you've got this thing at the bottom, which has got text, but it's actually just an image. And it's saying, please give ITAN number 110. So the customer has to look up their sheet. Um, but this is one image which also contains the amount and the destination account number and sort code. So if the criminal wants to change these details, they need to somehow patch up this image in order to put the details here, which the customer expects, yet really leave the TAN number, the ITAN number at the bottom unchanged. And in order to make this even harder, what the criminals, or what the bank has done is put the customer's date of birth in the background. And hopefully the customer is actually going to check this. So this does make life harder for the criminals. The banks that deployed this, deployed this did see a reduction in fraud, but there are a number of attacks that can still be performed. Um, one is simply breaking the captcha, so working out what the, the date of birth is, um, working out what TAN number is going to be requested, um, and then generating a new image with the details that the customer is expecting. Um, this one, this capture is relatively easy to do. There are better design ones which are harder to do. And then you might actually have to involve a human in the loop. So you might have to send the capture over to someone working in the equivalent of a call center for the criminals. That person types in the TAN that is being requested and then it gets sent back in a modified form to the customer. So in some ways, ITAN and CAPTCHAs like this did what they were expected to do. They kept fraud under control for a while, but they're never seen as being the final solution when it came to defeating fraud. And that's why I think most banks are now moving to some more trustworthy device than the computer in order for authenticating transactions. In the UK, the device that was chosen um, is, are called CAP readers. Um, CAP stands for the Chip Authentication Programme, uh, which is a, a protocol specification. It's not publicly available, but it's based on the EMV standards, so most of it can be reverse engineered, and some research I did with colleagues was to reverse engineer this protocol and see whether it was secure or not. The way it works is similar to an EMV transaction. Um, this is because the card only knows about EMV. It actually knows very little about the CAP protocol itself. So it just performs a transaction as if it was talking to an offline point of sale terminal. So the customer types the PIN into this device. Um, this is sent to the card and the card checks whether it's actually correct or not. 
The customer then enters in transaction details into this little calculator device, and this transaction details are then processed by the card. The other information that goes into the card is a counter, the application transaction counter, 16-bit number that increments each time you insert a card, and anything that was entered in by the customer, and also the result of pin entry. Unlike the point of sale terminals, the, whether the pin is entered correctly is actually checked. So as far as I can tell, no banks are vulnerable to the equivalent of the no pin attack I discussed yesterday when it comes to online banking. So the card calculates a MAC over all these details, normally using symmetric, well, always using symmetric cryptography, normally using triple des, and then the reader displays a decimal value on the screen. The length varies, um, but the information in it will be um, some bits from the MAC that was generated, not all of them, because that would be far too long for a customer to type in, but enough to have some reasonable confidence that this is not a spoof response code. You also have to include some bits from this counter. I mentioned that each time you put this card in, you get a new value for the counter. And as a result, you might have put the card in several times before the transaction actually got performed. And so the bank not, might not know exactly what the transaction counter is going to be. And because the transaction counter goes into the cal calculation of the MAC, if the MAC, or if the application transaction is wrong, they won't be able to repeat the same computation. So probably the least um, significant bits of this, um, maybe at least three significant bits, at least seven significant bits of the transaction counter will actually go in the response code. And that's why if you look at the response code generated by one of these devices, you'll start to see patterns in the first few digits. That's the counter gradually increasing. So in some ways, this is reasonably sound. Um, all the bits that you'd expect are there. There's a pin verification. There's a Mac being calculated. Um, there is a moderately secure processor performing this on the card. Um, but there's been quite serious problems when it comes to usability, just like there was for 3D Secure. Although CAP is an international specification, there has been quite a lot of changes in how it actually gets implemented um, by each country which uses it. Uh, in the UK, the card readers have got three buttons. You've got identify, respond and sign. So identify is just a one-time password. You push the button, you enter in your PIN, and it will give you a response code. There is also response mode, where the reader will prompt you for a number. It will say number on the screen. And you type in this number, and then this number gets sent to the card, and the Mac is calculated over this. And sign takes two parameters. It asks for um, some sort of reference. So it says ref on the screen. Um, which is normally a destination account number, although this is not clear to the user, and the amount. But not all banks have used these very consistently. If we take two examples, Barclays require use of the cap reader in order to log in and also for doing transactions. When you log in, you press identify, you get a one-time password, you type that in. And when you're going to do a transaction, you use sign mode you enter the destination account number in there, and you enter in the amount that you want to transfer. On the other hand, we've got NatWest, um, who do not use identify mode or sign mode. They only use respond mode. They do not use it for login. All they do is they um, use it for performing transactions. And when the reader asks you for a number, the bank will instruct you to enter in an eight-digit number. The first four digits are supposedly random, and then the last four are the last four digits of destination account number. So you can sort of see what the NatWests are trying to do here. They're trying to make things a bit more convenient, um, and they're also trying to still link up the transaction to the response code because the last four digits of the account number are going in there as well. But this does allow criminals to 
trick users. And in particular, what criminals have been doing is they've been putting malware on customers' computers, and then they've been asking customers to, um, when they log in to NatWest, to give one of these response codes. Now, NatWest don't ask for this, but Barclays do, so that's sort of plausible. And what the criminals ask you to do when you log in is they say, type this eight digit number into your device. And because the device is just saying, please give um, a number, you give it a number, just like you're being told. But what that actually is, is a transaction which is going to be performed behind the scenes, transferring money to a criminal's account. There are also some protocol problems. One is how information actually gets sent to the card. If you ever have to use Max message authentication codes, a key requirement is that whatever you put into the Mac operation is unambiguous. It should represent what you think is actually going to happen or what is happening. But because there's been a need to be backwards compatible with EMV, EMV cards only have one mode, whereas CAP has four, sorry, CAP has three, and there isn't proper disambiguation between them. So in terms of what gets sent to the card, the card knows about two parameters. Um, the first one is um, the amount, and then the second one is the unpredictable number. When you press identify, the card sees a zero amount and zero unpredictable number. When you press the respond button, it will ask you for the, the number. The, um, and then this is sent in the unpredictable number field, um, whereas um, the amount field is set to zero. And when you press the sign button, then indeed you get the amount and you get the account number. But apart from that, there's no difference between these modes from the perspective of the card and importantly, from the perspective of the calculation of the Mac, which is performed. And this means that if you can get someone to perform a signed transaction for an amount which is zero, then actually what you've asked them to do is a respond transaction where the account number they typed in is going to be interpreted as a challenge. And then you can now get someone to effectively press the respond button, even though you've got them to push an entirely different button. And how you can phrase this to them is, we need to perform some checks and you're going to need to do a test transaction. And you don't need to worry because the amount is only zero. Actually, you've done, from the card's perspective, something entirely different. Another problem is the, the nonce. So a number used once, standard part of a protocol. And what a nonce is supposed to do is make sure that the protocol is happening now rather than this being a bit of a protocol which is being replayed from some other time. And in the way that Barclays are um, using the transaction, um, there's actually no nonce there. What is sent to the card is an account number, which is predictable, and an amount which the attacker can choose. So it means that you can record a response at one point and then use it later on. Hopefully you won't be able to use it more than once because the transaction counter goes in there and hopefully the bank will spot if the transaction counter ever goes down. So you can only use it in the time window between you collecting this information and when the customer next uses their card. But in some cases that might be quite a uh, high, um, quite a high success rate. Even if you look at the NatWest system, you now might be able to see another thing that NatWest were trying to do. Um, they knew that this nonce was necessary, and so they wanted to add one into the protocol. But since this device only has three modes, they had to use the response mode, and then they only had ability to have a four-digit response. So if you can get 100 guesses from the card um, or 100 responses from a card corresponding to 100 guesses of this number, you're going to get a 63% success rate, which due to the large amounts of money you can transfer using online banking is probably going to be a good return on investment. 
And even if this nonce was a large cryptographically generated random number, that's still not going to protect against real account, uh, real time attacks. Someone can go into the bank, perform a transaction, see what the nonce is, then if they have access to the card, they perform the card transaction, get a Mac, send that bank to the bank to the bank, and then the transaction goes through. So we did a demonstration of this. Um, this was for BBC Inside Out, same program that you saw before, where we wanted to demonstrate how it would be possible to make someone think they're doing a transaction at point of sale when actually they're doing an online banking transaction. Okay. So there are some other disadvantages of these camp readers. Um, another one is that it introduced a, a new type of technique for mugging. So previously, there were many cases where people would um, be attacked in the street. They would be then taken to an ATM and asked to enter in their card number. Um, or asked to enter in their PIN in order to perform an ATM transaction. And then once the mugger has worked out that this transaction, that this is the correct PIN, they can then go away and, and use that card freely. Um, but that was a relatively high risk operation because the criminals got to march the customer to somewhere where there's an ATM. And these are normally in fairly visible situations. But with cap readers, it gave the criminals the ability to type um, or check someone's PIN in any situation because they could get a cap reader. This will work with any UK cards, even UK cards which have not been enabled for cap. It will still be able to, to check the PIN. And this is a different situation than some predecessor systems where the PIN was not checked by the card. Instead, what happened was that the PIN was sent um, back to the bank, and then the bank then checked it, um, and then the bank could then act appropriately and perhaps not leak much information um, to the criminal. Um, 
the recall watchword was one of the predecessor systems which introduced this and also introduced the ability of entering in a duress pin. If you typed in the wrong pin, it would say that the pin is correct, give a small amount of money, but then automatically cancel the card. Also, there is no secrets within these cap readers. They're relatively cheap. They don't have any significant tamper protection as used by most banks. So it's quite possible to do black box reverse engineering like what we did and then uh, use a computer connected up to one of these cards in order to perform unattended operations. Um, there is already some software available on the web for doing this and this again starts increasing the risks of using cards if a lot of people start doing that because now you've got a copy of your PIN in a computer, you've got um, your card connected up to a computer and this could be used for example um, ATM transactions when there's going to be a, a MagStripe fallback possible. So this does raise the question of whether CAP is actually good for UK customers. It does address the problem that PCI DSS fails to address. You're no longer having a, a secret that you tell to everyone, a contradiction in terms. It is generating one-time passwords. The cryptography is reasonable, although the way the cryptography has used has seen some problems. And also the authentication codes are being bound to the transaction. So if the transaction you type into the device does not match the transaction which the bank thinks, then the response code will be invalid. However, this has introduced again the question of liability and what it means for the customer to be considered negligent. Because if the customer is negligent, they are no longer entitled to the protections offered by the Payment Services Directive. And what was found out that when the UK moved from signature to PIN at point of sale, the amount of people who are lost money as a result of fraud went up. So we now might start to see the same patterns when it comes to online banking. As I mentioned, although UK CAP is um, UK specific, there are other variations of CAP which are designed to fix some of these problems. And the, Germany has a set of standards um, called HHD. Uh, 1.3 was one of the more interesting ones. And this fixes a number of the issues. So one is that there are a lot more modes. There's not three that are selected by pushing a button, but there are plenty of them, um, and actually a growing number of them, which are selected by the initial digits of the challenge. And because you can have a large number of possible scenarios, you can actually produce fairly useful prompts on the display and asking what the user thinks is going to happen. So if you're going to ask users to change the telephone number, you can ask them for a telephone number. If they're going to do a bank transfer, you can ask them for destination account number, um, challenge, um, and the amount that they want to transfer. It doesn't have to be very generic things like ref or number. You can have a nonce, which makes offline attacks harder. It still doesn't protect against um, real-time man-in-the-middle attacks. And because the nonce and the mode number get included in the Mac, you don't get this protocol confusion that the UK bank saw. And also pin verification can be made op optional. This is good for usability, but also it's quite good for security too, because you no longer have the situation where these devices can be used to check the pin on behalf of criminals. There are still usability problems with HHD 1.3. Um, one is that the number of scenarios has started to get a bit unmanageable because when this reader is deployed, it has to have all the possible scenarios that the banks think the customer might ever need to use. Uh, the other problem with it is the customer might actually have to enter in quite a lot of information into this device in order for the customer to have some meaningful 
information that allows them to decide whether they want this transaction to perform. Um, if it's just, say, the last four digits of the account number, then maybe that could be interpreted by the bank as the last four digits of um, someone else's account number or an entirely different type of transaction to the same account number. So in order to improve both security and usability, you've got to increase the bandwidth. Although you really only need to increase the bandwidth in one direction. You need to increase the bandwidth between the bank and the customer's trustworthy device. And there's a few options for doing this. One is called um, Flickr TAN. This is used by Sparkasse in Germany. And you've got this little device, you stick your card in. It's got a keypad for entering in a pin if necessary. Um, this is also um, useful for overriding the, the Flickr TAN if it doesn't work properly. And what happens is you hold this device up to the screen, you line up these two arrows. Um, this is generated by JavaScript or an animated GIF. And then you click um, some plus minus buttons on the screen um, for choosing um, the gap between these two arrows. But once you've done all these steps, this device has, um, I think, five little photo sensors which read this flickering pattern up here, and that sends information from the bank to the card. The bandwidth is still pretty low, so it's not able to display free text on this device, but it's good enough for um, choosing between the scenarios that are available in HHD. When this has actually been used, it has had quite a lot of problems, however. It's very hard to get working correctly. Um, in particular, the, the customer has to adapt using the plus and minus buttons to line up the arrows, as shown up here. Um, and also, it seems to be quite temperamental, depending on the type of display. If you look at the support forums, you will see people saying, um, um, like, turn off the lights in your house, um, set, the res set the resolution to this, set the refresh rate to this, and then it will probably work the third time you try. So the usability is not as good as it was hoped. Um, and also customers get a bit annoyed by having to carry around this device, their card, um, and then have this thing flickering at them on the screen. So another option is have a connected card reader. Uh, this one um, is connected via USB. So you've now got um, very high bi-directional bandwidth. And that allows you to do some useful things. And this is in particular used for the HBCI and FinTS protocols for online banking. But again, it's not really suitable for most people. You've got to carry this thing around with you. You've got to plug this in. You've also got to install drivers on your computer in order to make this work. Um, this is quite problematic for customers who do their online banking from work computers. It will now be a problem for customers who do their online banking from iOS devices because they don't have a USB port that you can plug a smart card reader into. Um, there is one advantage, however, is that they can do asymmetric digital signatures. Um, for all of the other options I'm talking about, they've only got high unidirectional bandwidth, and so that whatever you type into the bank has to be, say, six or maybe 10 digits, and that's not enough to perform an asymmetric signature, whereas it's perfectly easy to perform an asymmetric signature in this device and then send it over using the USB port to the bank. And this can allow compliance with the EU Digital Signature Directive, if that's something that the bank wants. There are, tends to be a lot of cultural differences in how digital signatures are used. And in the UK, they're almost entirely not used. They don't have any special legal basis compared to a handwritten signature. Um, in Germany, they're a bit more paid attention to because they actually do have some legal weight. But in most of Scandinavia, it's very common to use um, qualified digital signature devices as part of a PKI in order to do online banking. So it really does vary a lot between customers. And another option is um, PhotoTan. So this is a system that I worked on and 
since I talked about this last year, the, the company has now been acquired by Vasco. Uh, Vasco make um, little one-time password tokens that there's a good chance that you've probably used. And um, this is called Phototan in Germany. It's called CrotoSign in other countries. And in, like all Vasco products, it's called the, the uh, DP something or other. Um, in this case, the, the DP760. And this was a spin out of Cambridge University research. Um, really came from two different departments. One was the machine learning artificial intelligence group of the engineering department. And what they did was come up with a way of sending information from the bank to the customer in a usable way. So rather than using a flickering code, we designed a special 2D barcode that was optimized for the scenario. And so it worked much better than off the shelf standards for 2D barcodes or the flickering code. It also had much more capacity. So we were able to encode free text and we didn't have the problem of HHD 1.3 where you had to work out all the scenarios in advance. And another choice that was made is make it available um, on the mobile phone. Now, mobile phones um, are not as trustworthy as a standalone device. They've got some nice security features. They're certainly better than a PC. And even if you ignore that fact, they're still separate from the PC. So it's going to be quite hard, or at least it's going to be harder to compromise both of these devices simultaneously than compromising one of them by itself. And the principle of security behind the system is you must compromise both the device and the computer in order to violate the key security properties. So there's an iPhone version, Android, uh, Windows Phone, um, I think is out for most of the banks, uh, BlackBerry as well. This was the, the phone version of it was the first product which was released um, because it's much easier for a small company to develop software rather than hardware. But there was always a plan to develop hardware. Um, one comment that we frequently got at the beginning was people believe that phone cameras were never going to catch on and so we could not guarantee that a phone would, uh, camera would be present on the phone. Well, that turned out not to be realistic. Pretty much any device you can think of that can have enough battery to handle a camera does have a camera. So that got solved. But still, many customers might not want to use a smartphone for doing online banking. So there was an option of having um, a dedicated bit of hardware, which I'll show a picture of later. So this has much better security properties than other solutions um, because this phone is being kept on their person. Uh, people will recognize whether they lose their phone much more rapidly than whether they recognize whether that um, they've lost their card. And there are a number of banks using this. So Commerzbank and Comdirect in Germany, uh, Raiffeisen in Switzerland, and there's a, a few others hopefully in the pipeline. So here's the um, DP760 device. Um, this doesn't have um, very many buttons. Um, really, all you have to use is the on button in almost all purposes. Um, the reason that we were able to do this is the 2D barcode is much more reliable than the flickering code, and therefore it wasn't necessary to have a fallback. Um, for all intents and purposes, this will work every time. Sometimes you might see charts like this. Um, this is a comparison of online banking security. Um, you have to be very aware that um, these are probably going to be not representative. The details are not particularly important, but um, along here you've got security features. Along here um, you've got various banks, and then they're ranking each of them um, according to a score. This sort of looks like the reviews that you get for washing machines, and typically it's done by the same organizations that do, do reviews for washing machines. And quite often they don't appreciate that the situation for online banking is a lot more complicated. And when an, I've been asked to um, do surveys like this, um, 
when the organisation asks me what sort of test that we should do, I tell them what they want to do and they say that sounds a bit too complicated, we'll find another expert please. And then they end up producing a, a graph a bit like this, there's one just out for Germany. And these don't tell the full story. What they don't tell is important information like do the victims of fraud get their money back? Um, in some ways it's up to the bank what sort of security they do, provided they give adequate refunds to the customers which are a victim of insecurity. Also, when fraud does happen, are the banks good at reversing it? So Barclays mentioned that they noticed a dramatic decrease in the amount of fraud when they deployed their card readers. This is true, um, but I don't think it was actually because of these card readers that the amount of fraud went down. What actually happened is Barclays got much, much more competent at getting money back when it left customers' accounts. Um, if you compared, say, Barclays to HSBC, HSBC are a very international bank and they found it relatively easy to find someone who knew the manager of a bank when money left Bar um, HSBC to go to a criminal in another country. They explain the situation and the money gets sent back. So now the criminal has wasted their time and they've not gotten any money out of it and so they might well give up. On the other hand, Barclays had a lot of difficulty in reversing these frauds and so they lost a lot more money. But as soon as they got better at it, then criminals stopped targeting them. And are there better ways at detecting frauds that the bank is going to do? The banks don't just use whatever security mechanisms that the customers see. They also will probably have some back-end fraud detection system which will reject transactions that are unusual. And that's not something that you will be able to see when you're generating one of these charts. And these will also not show you invisible protections that the bank might have deployed. For example, device fingerprinting or things like um, Trusteer. So Trusteer is a bit of software that you install on your computer. It talks back to the bank and it says it's running and then it looks for what else is running on your computer. And in particular, it looks for malware that's running on your computer. It is nowhere near guaranteed. It's essentially a special purpose antivirus, but it does give some security and it also is not something that will show up in one of these charts. So it's important to bear any of these comparisons with a lot of scepticism. So in conclusion, I've covered the 3D secure system, which is performing a worthwhile task. It's trying to move away from secrets you tell everyone, but it does have serious problems because the usability and particularly the security usability has not been thought through. Where it has had some success from the bank's perspective is giving them opportunity to pass liability on to the customer. And this has financial costs, but also can have quite a significant human cost. In terms of phishing, I think it's going to be unlikely that it will ever be possible to prevent people being tricked to entering confidential details into their web browser. And even if you did, malware would be able to bypass most of the protections. So really, there's got to be some way of binding transactions description in order, um, well, binding authentication information with transaction information together. And that's a lot more likely to be resulting in security technology, which is effective. But it's not sufficient just to do this. You also need to make sure that the, there's been a good design from the perspective of the cryptography um, and also from the perspective of the usability. Otherwise, you might end up making the situation worse. And finally, I showed that there are some things that you need to bear in mind uh, when you're looking at these comparisons of security mechanisms, whether this is for banking security or whether this is for any other system, because these only tell a part of the story. Okay, um, thank you. And do anyone have questions? George? No? Nope. Okay. <laughs> no? 
Okay, well, I'll be around afterwards if anyone wants to take questions offline. Yeah. Thanks.